Today on the Bander Says Podcast, we will not be focusing on the coronavirus. We will be actively distracting you from that. So go ahead and stick around. Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to episode 2-0, Heaven of the BSP. My name is Bandrew. This is Says What I. Like always, timestamps in the show notes so you can skip around. And in this episode, there will be little to no coronavirus talk. Sick and tired of it. Don't want to contribute to the panic or fear or anything. I want to function as a distraction to you from everybody running around with their hair on fire. All I will say on this topic is... Please stay safe. Please take care of yourself and your loved ones. I appreciate you. I want you around. I want to be able to scream at you for years and years to come. Because everybody is so scared about this, pretty much every single piece of news this last week is focused on the virus. So I went to Twitter and I posted something saying, question, I don't want to skip the podcast episode today, but I rely on the news for each episode. There is almost zero news this week that is not directly related to COVID-19. I don't want to talk about this. I want to provide a relief from this news. What should I talk about? And let me tell you, y'all came back with some amazing responses. The first response was from Vert Shark. And they say, what can people do while they sit at home due to, um, um, um... Okay, I came up with a list for you, Vert Shark. I appreciate the question, and I think this is a great way to start... Please do not just sit there and watch the news and freak out and watch YouTube videos of people positing what's going on, where did this come from, what it's going to lead to, man, the the earth's on fire. Don't listen to that crap. Be productive. Read a book. Watch some movies that you have been dying to watch. Watch them. Watch the horror movies. Watch the comedies. Watch whatever the hell you want. You got a little bit of free time? Use it to the best of your ability. Enjoy it. Pick up that guitar that you've been meaning to learn for years and learn some new chords. Write a song. Write a dumb song that makes you giggle. Those are always the best songs. Side note, when I used to play in a band, whenever I wrote a song that I intentionally tried to make good, people hated it. The songs that I wrote that were jokes that I laughed at while I was writing them, those are the ones that people liked. I am guessing because subconsciously they could tell that I had a little bit more fun actually making them. There was a little bit more joy in those songs. So write, learn, the, learn a new chord on the guitar, write a song that makes you giggle, and if you want, record it, put it, out on the, put it out on the internet, or just share it with a friend. Have some fun with it. Clean up your house. That's not very fun, but sometimes you need to do it. Record a podcast. That's something I need to do. I have been putting off launching a podcast for maybe a year at this point. I also have another movie podcast that I have not put an episode out on in maybe two and a half months, two, two months. So I need to get on that as well. You could also make a YouTube video, something that everybody wants to do. One of the most popular jobs that kids want these days. They want to be a YouTuber. If you have some time off, Why not get started on that? Practice with it. Make a YouTube video. Edit it. Learn what you're doing wrong and improve upon it. Put out a video every single day. Have some fun with it. This doesn't have to be scary. You don't have to freak out and lose your mind all the time. Make a YouTube video. Or lastly, learn a new skill. This episode is brought to you by Share of the Skills. It's not. I don't have any advertisers. I have turned them all down. I don't want your ads. This is just fun for me. I don't want the pressure. But learn a new skill. Like I said, guitar. Pick up that bass. Do you want to learn how to make a website? Learn how to make a website. Sign up for some education classes online. Some of those online resources. Don't get scammed out of your money. But that is what people can do. That's a list of things that I think people can do while they're stuck sitting at home and enjoying a little bit of time off. But number one, do not freak out. Do not worry. Do not panic. Try to have some fun. Next, we got a response from Red Romina. By the way, Romina makes some amazing travel videos, and I watched one of her videos where she drank tea like 10 million feet in the sky, and watching it just gave me the worst anxiety that I have felt in a long time because I absolutely hate heights. But Romina, 
Look up Red Romina on YouTube. She makes really great travel videos. But she said, nudie branches. I am sure that's not how you pronounce it. But that's how I'm pronouncing it because I am an uncultured swine. I am a big fat pig who doesn't understand things. (laughs) I didn't know what these were, so I looked it up on Wikipedia. And I am going to read this to you because now is the time to learn. Nudie branches are a group of soft-bodied marine gastropod mollusks which shed their shells after the larval stage. They are noted for their often extraordinary colors and striking forms, and they have been given colorful nicknames to match, such as Clown, Marigold, Splendid, Dancer, Dragon, or Sea Rabbit. Oh, Sea Rabbit! What a legend! Why why am I acting this way? (laughs) Currently, about 3,000 valid species of nudie branches are known. The word nudie branch comes from the Latin nudus, which means naked, and the ancient Greek bronchia, which means gills. Bronchia, isn't that something in the lungs? A bronchial infection? Wait, does that mean, do we have gills? Bronch, I don't know. Just think about it. Think about it. Nudie branches are casually called sea slugs as they are a family of apistobranches, sea slugs, within the phylum mollusca, mollusks. But many sea slugs belong to several taxonomic groups, which are not closely related to nudie branches. A num- <laughs> that name is never going to get old. Nudie branches. Nudie branches. It's a branch where all the new people hang out. That's stupid. <laughs> I am a child. I have the mind of a 10-year-old boy. (laughs) Nudie. Anyways, a number of these sea slugs, such as Photosynthic Sacoglosa and the colorful Agilidae, are often confused with the nudie branches. Now you have learned. And guess what? Let me move out of the way. This is a nudie branch. Isn't it lovely? If you're not watching the YouTube video, go to the YouTube video. And here is a nudie branch. A nudie branch, very colorful, very playful. What a striking, striking thing. Red Romina, thank you very much for that recommendation. I had fun looking into that, and I saw one image of a nudie branch, which scared the pants off of me because it looks like some kind of demon. But then she sent me a bunch of other nudie branches, and there was one that looked like it had a little smile, and it was one of the cutest things I've ever seen. So here is that nudie branch, smiley face nudie branch. We call him Smiley. Smiley, good boy. Okay, thank you very much, Romina. Next, we got a a suggestion from Rev Jesse. He says, your favorite films that are currently streamable for free. Rev Jesse, thank you so much for this question. What a great question. And the reason I enjoyed this so much is I always forget that YouTube has free movies on their site that are supported by ads. I went to that list of movies They have a lot of good ones. They have a lot of really good ones. I came up with nine, I think it is. So I'm going to list those for you and maybe explain a little bit about them. Number one, War Games. This is a 1980s film starring Matthew Broderick. He is a computer hacker and he has a modem where you take the phone off the line and put it in this little saddle and it dials into a bunch of different numbers and he stumbles across a DOD computer, I think it is, at... Somewhere in Colorado, the missile defense thing, and he plays a game with a computer thinking it's just a normal computer game titled Global Thermo Nuclear War. Turns out it's a simulation and people think it's a real nuclear war and hell breaks loose. And it is still one of my favorite movies of all time. It is so good and so much fun. And Matthew Matthew Broderick just charming. Everybody in that movie acts it so well and really good movie, especially if you're into that hacking and conspiracy and stuff like that. Next, The Host. You may not know about this movie. This is a Korean film, but this was made by the director who made the award winner, the Academy Award winner for Best Picture, Parasite. This is about an alien killing a bunch of people in Korea. And good golly gee willikers, I put this off for so long, people have been recommending it to me for over a decade. Finally got around to watching it. Totally worth it. It is just an incredible horror movie, monster movie. The characters are likable. 
you got your dopey loser guy who just wants to work in his food truck and hang out with his daughter and make sure she eats. He's a loser, but he rises to the occasion. It is excellent. Next, hackers. Do I need to say any more? Matthew Lillard. What is his name? Serial killer. <laughs> Hack the planet. Amazing movie. Fourth, over the top, Sylvester Stallone in an arm wrestling movie. A movie based on arm wrestling and truck driving. <laughs> Could you ask for anything better? No, you can't. Over the top. Next, The Arrival. Probably my favorite Charlie Sheen movie because it is about aliens invading planet Earth and terraforming planet Earth, if I remember correctly. It's been a while. Maybe I need to rewatch this. But The Arrival is about aliens and Charlie Sheen is in it and it's excellent if you're into aliens and Charlie Sheen. Next, Cube. This is a sci-fi horror movie where a bunch of strangers wake up in a cube and they have to find their way out. Little do they know as they travel around, they die in inventive ways. It is a really fun sci-fi horror movie. Very low budget. I believe it's Canadian and maybe $500,000. Really well done. Really tense. The acting, maybe not the best. The acting kind of cheesy, but still a really fun movie if you're into that. Next up is one of my all-time favorite documentaries. It is called Mirage Men, and it is about disinformation campaigns by government employees and military agencies to keep secrets under wraps. The reason I heard about this is I read a book called Project Beta, which is a story, not a story, it's an actual event where the military drove somebody insane because they had stumbled across some secret communications and they manipulated this person into thinking that it was actual extra extraterrestrial communications. The person ended up in a mental hospital. Very sad story, but very compelling and very dark, conspiratorial, whatever you want to call it. Horrifying. Mirage Men has one of the dudes who is responsible for it in it. It's his first interview on camera ever. Amazing, amazing documentary. Again, if you're into conspiracies and secret societies, not really secret societies, but just the nefarious goings on behind the scene. Next, Citizen Four, Edward Snowden. Not the best documentary, but still a really fun watch if you're scared of people being spying on you. <laughs> and lastly, Sound City. If you like audio, if you're watching this podcast, chances are you like audio because that's probably how you found me. Sound City, it's about recording studios and a bunch of stuff that went on in L.A. Again, all of these are free on YouTube. They are supported by ads, so it's like you're going to be watching them on TV, suffering through the ads. But I will link all of them in the episode notes so you can just click on it and watch the dang thing. How cool is that? Hand-picked movie selections from Bandrew, the idiot who doesn't know anything about anything, and he calls them nudie branches. He can't even pronounce that right. Well, why would you trust me to pick your movies for you? Next, we got a comment from J.V. Castillo. He says, I know you're more about mics and such, but how about talking about your background in the industry and your favorite interest outside of microphones? J.V., thank you very much for the question and suggestion. My interest in audio all started out of necessity. In high school, I was in bands. We could not afford to record or pay to go to recording studios and get professional recordings done. So we bought or I bought or I was purchased for me a Radio Shack dynamic microphone for a birthday. You know how I recorded it? I plugged that microphone directly into the motherboard microphone jack and recorded some of the worst sounding demos that have likely ever been recorded. But at that time... DAWs weren't very popular, audio interfaces were very expensive, affordable condenser microphones were insanely expensive, especially for a high schooler, so that was the only thing we could afford, and it worked, we got into Battle of the Bands, we did all that stuff, and then as we got older, we would still record our demos just because we wanted to work out all the kinks, find out what we wanted to change in the song structure and the composition before paying to actually get it professionally recorded. 
But when it came time to put out, put out a CD, we would pay and then go to a studio. So my interest in audio all started out of necessity and being a broke son of a gun who couldn't afford anything and just wanted to record their band. Now, as far as my, my favorite interest outside of audio, probably movies. I am a huge movie buff. I am not a good movie critic. I am one of those idiots who likes pretty much everything they see. It is a very rare instance where I will poo-poo a movie and say, this is trash, man. I hate everything about it because it doesn't matter. I It's hard for me to find a movie that I truly hate, that I truly hate. I might dislike a movie or say, ah, that was all right. It was a movie, but movies are probably my favorite interest, particularly horror movies. I, I love the ability to just shut off my brain after a stressful day at work and responding to hateful YouTube comments and just watch people go through horrifying circumstances. And to justify my love for horror films, I know I have done this in the past. The way I view it is it puts my life into context because no matter how stressful my day job is or no matter how many hateful comments I get on YouTube, sure, that could suck. Oh, I'm so stressed out. But then I put on a horror movie where Leatherface is chasing you with a chainsaw and putting you on a meat hook. At least that's not happening to me. Life could be so much worse. Leatherface could be trying to murder me. He's not now. So life is pretty good. Getting yelled at is pretty good. That's pretty, pretty, pretty good. That's why I like horror movies. I hope that answered your question, JV Castillo. I appreciate you. Next suggestion from Christian M. He says, top five conspiracy theories. What a good suggestion. Number one, the Roswell crash. This is something that I've been fascinated in. I think the reason I got into aliens, truthfully, is Tom DeLonge from Blink-182. I found Blink-182 in 97, and then I found out that he was into UFOs, and that dove me so deep into UFOs and aliens. I love it. So the Roswell crash is something that has always fascinated me. And along the same lines, number two is Area 51. Now, having said that, I think that Annie Jacobson's book on Area 51 answers both of those topics perfectly. And I think she did really great research and explained away a lot of my fear or conspiracy surrounding those. Of course, she could be a disinformation artist, a disinformation agent. I don't know. Maybe. But those are the, the top two. Third, the JFK assassination. I don't think we'll ever know what truly happened. I love the idea of... Well, I shouldn't say I love the idea, especially given the topic area. I guess what I mean is I like thinking about what would lead to somebody being killed for their beliefs or their power or what were they planning to do that led to somebody wanting them gone. Was it the mafia? Was it the government? What was it? I want to know. I don't think we ever will. But I think there's a lot of interesting questions there. And if we did ever find out, I think we'd all lose our minds. Number four, secret societies ruling the world, the Bilderberg Group, all of the college frats, Skull and Bones. I can't think of any others. I just listened to something on Skull and Bones. That's not something, at least the, the frats aren't anything too nefarious, I don't think. But the secret societies like the Bilderberg Group, even though it's not secret, <laughs> there's something fascinating about that. A group of the wealthiest and most influential people getting together every year or two and determining where is the world going to go? How are we going to manipulate the world and the economy and society to get the world in a direction that we want it to go? I find that fascinating and horrifying. To go back to last week's episode, I talked about why I like conspiracies and it directly correlates to this selection here. I like the idea of conspiracies because it implies order into this world as opposed to complete and utter chaos, which is what it most likely is. So all of these horrifying events that occur, it's terrifying to think it just happens, just complete and utter chaos out there, nothing you can do about it, as opposed to 
that evil group over there, they're the ones manipulating all the strings and making sure that this is happening exactly how they want it. I don't know why that's more comforting to me, but it is. And number five, the reptilian elite. I can't say much more about that because my brethren would uh, strike me down. My brethren, I mean, no, no, I'm not a reptilian elite at all. No, no, not at all. Okay. Thank you very much. For, <laughs> thank you very much for the suggestion, Christian Apriya. Next, we got a comment or a suggestion from the Jet Set Nerd. He says, headphones? On the topic of headphones, I will address why I don't typically review them or share many thoughts on them because headphones are insanely subjective and it is very difficult, if not impossible, to provide an accurate presentation of how the headphones perform so that the people watching your video or listening to your review or reading your review can get their own opinion and develop their own opinion. That's why I like microphones and audio interfaces. I'm able to record that device, upload it, and the people watching that review have a fairly complete understanding of the performance of that device. Headphones can't do that. And I don't think I have the vocabulary or the expertise like some other people who focus on headphones do. So I steer clear of them. But I have tested a lot of them. I've tried the Neumanns. I have tried a bunch of different Sennheisers. All of the AT, M50s, M40s, M30s, M20s. What else? Sure, SRH 1540s, Sennheiser HD 650s. And what I've always come back to is the 7506s by Sony for tracking and just for general listening in a studio situation would be the HD 650s. Some of the most pleasing to listen to headphones for myself. And when I'm out and about, I like the SE425s, IEMs. And on the note of those IEMs, I bought them when they initially had the Gen 1 Bluetooth cable. Absolute garbage, trash, unusable, noisiest thing, terrible latency. And after two years of using Sure IEMs, I finally bought the Gen 2 Bluetooth cable. Exponentially better. Clean audio. The latency is still there, but it's not terrible. It's it's manageable. It's serviceable. And I love it. I love it. The fit and the isolation is incredible on those IEMs. I know some people like the AirPods and AirPods Pro. AirPods Pro, huge step up from the regular AirPods. One of my main complaints stems from watching Juan Carlos Bagnell's video about your ear health and how the complete lack of seal on the AirPods leads to you cranking the volume, which ultimately will damage your hearing, which is why I opted to go with IEMs. But going from the AirPods, which have no seal, no noise cancellation, no nothing, you're cranking the volume, then to the AirPods Pro, they do have rubber tips, so it does get a tiny bit of a seal, and the noise cancellation means you're not getting as much bleed from the outside world and you don't have to crank the volume as much. So I, I think it is a big improvement. But for me, IEMs, the SE 425s or 535s, MDR 7506s and HD 650s all the way. Next, we got a suggestion from Trey Coleman. He says, hey, man, new to your stuff, so not sure if you've covered it before. I'd like to know more about audio interfaces for different podcasting needs. Sorry if you've covered this already. Trey, that is a very difficult question because everybody is going to have different needs. Some people are 100% in on mixers because they need the complex routing of all the analog signals. They have 20 different outboard things that are feeding audio into a mixer, down mixing it to a stereo, and then sending it out to a stream, and then recording it to an outboard recorder for backup. There's people who have all sorts of different needs. I think for a basic home studio, in-person podcaster the only real thing you need is an xlr input 
assuming you're not doing Skype calls or anything like that. So if you are just doing one or two or four people at home, basic budget audio interface, the Behringer UMC 404 HD has four XLR inputs. That is going to suffice for most people. You got four XLR inputs. You could have four microphones in the room, records to four separate tracks, so you can mix and master each of those separately in post. And pretty stellar for the price. You could start to go down the dark road of audio interfaces, trying to find the best preamps and A to D converters and D to A converters and all of that. One of my favorites is the Motu M2 or if you want to get a few more features, the Motu M4. The reason I like that, the preamps are clean. It has IO, which stands for in-out for days. It has all that you would need for outputs. And as long as you don't need more than two inputs, works perfectly. It has usable meters. It has monitor on off for each track, phantom power on off for each track. It has an on and off switch for the entire interface. Beautiful. And the headphone amp, stellar. The A to D converter, stellar. The D to A converter, stellar. All around an incredible device. Of course, you could go the route of the SSL2 that has more coloration to it once you engage the 4K switch. But I think the M2, the M2 does have loopback functionality. The SSL2 does not. So it's... It's a really hard question to answer because I don't know what your individual specific needs are and I would need more information there. But for most people, if they are just doing at home podcasting in person, pretty much any audio interface is going to work. And I do personally recommend audio interface over mixer because you are going to be able to record each of the microphone inputs to a separate track, meaning you're able to adjust levels and do mixing, do EQ, do different compression, do whatever you need to get the best sound as possible. So that's why I recommend audio interfaces, and I hope that gave you some insight. If you have more questions, send me an email, askbandrew at gmail.com, and I'll address it on a future episode. Next, we have a suggestion from Noah Bershotsky. Sorry, I mispronounced it. He said, you should do a tutorial. And I responded with, well, what do you want a tutorial on? And he responded, one issue that baffles me is equalizing a microphone in post. For example, I use a Rode Wireless Go and get the positioning like I see in other videos. I think the levels are okay, but when I hear it play back, it sounds very trebly without a lot of full sound. Same with other mics too. Noah, thank you very much for that suggestion. I don't know where you said this, but at one point I thought you said you had the BPHS-1 and you were getting bad sound that was very lacking in body. So what I did, I recorded a quick sample with my BPHS-1 headset microphone and I recorded a tutorial of me EQing it, showing you the process about how I go through it, showing you the before, showing you the after, and... Here it is. Hopefully it helps you, Noah. Thank you for the suggestion. All right, so I have two tracks here. The first one being the sample that I recorded with the BPHS-1. The second one being an audio sample from the microphone I'm using right now. I'm going to use that as a baseline to see how I am doing with the processing, albeit the microphone that I am using right now does have a bunch of processing other than EQ but I'm going to use that as a baseline. So let me play the BPHS-1 for you really quickly. Okay, so right now I am speaking into the Audio-Technica BPHS-1. First thing you'll notice is the complete lack of body in the low end. So I will continue to play this audio sample and I will start to add some low end to it. I will use a low shelf to start off. So let me play it. Okay, so right now I am speaking into the Audio-Technica beep and I will add a low shelf. Okay, so right now I am speaking into the Audio-Technica BPHS-1. So I hear nothing I... when I'm boosting it at around 75 hertz, so I will increase the frequency that I'm boosting it at. Okay, so right now I am speaking into the Audio-Technica BPHS-1. Right there, a 10 decibel low shelf at around 240 hertz really adds a lot of that body that the headset microphone is lacking. So I'll play it with and without that boost again. 
Okay, so right now I am speaking this is without? into the Audio Technica BPHS1. This I is am with. running this directly into my Focusrite 18i20. Huge improvement. Now, something I always do is add a high pass. So I will go ahead and add a high pass around 50 hertz because we don't really need anything below 50 hertz. There's no useful information. All that will do is add mud to the recording. So this is with the high pass at 50 hertz and the low shelf at 240 with a 10 dB boost. Okay, so right now I am speaking into the Audio Technica B. Something else I think this needs is a little bit of clarity. So we will do a high shelf here. So I will go ahead and add that while I play the sample. Okay, so right now I am speaking into the Audio Technica BPHS1. I am running this directly into my Focusrite 18i20. My gain is set just shy of 100%. I am just recording for me. Okay, so I think that's actually pretty good. Now let me compare this to the Telefunken recording so we can compare how those sound. The Telefunken TF-47 running through a bunch of processing. Okay, so right now I am speaking in... Okay, so it's pretty good. It's a huge improvement over what it was, but I still hear a little bit of nasal tones to this probably because of my voice, so I will show you how I would cut those out. First, I am going to use a notch, a really narrow EQ bump, and I will boost this quite a bit. I know exactly the tone that I'm listening for. It is this obnoxious eh, eh, eh type sound. So let me go ahead and turn that off. I'll start playing it. Okay, so right now I am speaking I apologize into for this. the Audio Technica BPHS1 I am running this directly into my Focusrite 18i20. My gain is set just shy of one. Right there around 980 to maybe 1000 hertz, I hear some nasty uh, sounds, so. Okay, so right now I am speaking into the Audio Technica BPHS1. I am running this directly into my Focusrite 18i20. My gain is set just shy of 100%. I am just recording for maybe 30 seconds to a minute, so I have a good audio sample that I'm... Okay, so I actually think that EQ sounds pretty nice, so I will go ahead and one last time, I suppose I should tell you what I did there. I did an eight, at 800 hertz, I did a negative 6 dB cut with a Q of 2.8, so it's kind of a wide Q, it's kind of cutting a lot of frequencies between 800 and 1000, but that's where it sounded best. And it's gonna be different for everybody's voice, but now I will play with and without the EQ so you can hear the difference that was made. First without, then I will click it on. Okay, so right now I am speaking into the Audio Technica BPHS1. I am running this directly into my Focusrite 18i20. My gain is set just shy of 100%. I am just... So there you have it. I think that was a huge, huge, huge improvement over the raw audio from the BPHS-1. Adds that body to it. Adds some nice clarity and openness to the top end. And cuts out a little bit of those nasal frequencies in the midsection. So let me know what you thought of that. You can send me an email, askbander at gmail.com or you can leave a comment on the YouTube video. There you go. Wow, all right, that's how you EQ. Noah, I hope that helped you a lot. I hope that helps you get better sound and more full of a sound because I know the headset microphones can be quite lacking in the oomph. Doesn't have the same balls that a, a large diaphragm dynamic or a large diaphragm condenser has. So hopefully helps get there. Great question. Now let's jump to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. And we have two voice submissions today. Somebody did send in a video submission, but I wasn't able to download it, so I can't include it. Sorry, you know who you are. Maybe next week I'll be able to find a way to download it, but I wasn't able to this week, so I apologize. First voice submission comes from Ton. Take it away, Ton. Hi, Bandrew. My name is Ton Bettis. 
I work in academia as a horticulturist and over the last few years have caught the podcasting bug. Several weeks ago, I was listening to the news and some researchers had been researching audio qualities of Stradivarius violins as compared to modern high-end violins through double-blind tests where both the researchers and those listening did not know what violin the audio came from. In many instances, the modern violins and the opinions of those people sounded better than the Stradivarius violins. I thought this was interesting, and many people in the music world were not very happy. Along these lines, I was listening to a podcast on podcast engineering, and the host was given several samples recorded through microphones, and the host did not know what microphone the audio came from. The host determined what audio he liked best, and it actually was from fairly inexpensive microphones and not something from Neumann or other really high-end companies. My question for you is, are you aware of any research concerning microphones spanning anything from such as Behringer to the microphones coming out of Asia that are very inexpensive on Amazon up into something like Neumann that compares audio without the researchers or those listening knowing beforehand where the audio was recorded from, whether it was from a Neumann mic or from something less expensive. It would be interesting to see the results to know what um, ha happened. Ton, what a wonderful, wonderful question. And I am sorry to say this. Unfortunately, I am unaware of any scientifically conducted studies that study the different preferences of listeners in regards to microphone preference, including a wide range of microphones at different price points from $30 to $3,000. I don't know of any studies like that. I am a member of the Audio Engineering Society, and I went through their journal and found a few different articles which aren't directly related or directly answer, answering your question, but they are tangentially related. The first one is titled, what is it? Microphone Comparison for Snare Drum Recording. Not exactly what you're looking for. Um, then we have an online resource for subjective comparison of vocal microphones. Not sure if that's going to be it. And lastly, this isn't an AES journal entry. This is audiotestkitchen.com. That's a website with 300 different microphones, I believe. I think they are all condenser microphones. It doesn't have studies on what people prefer but it does allow you to do blind comparisons between microphones that you're interested in and then make a selection based on that. And then it will tell you which microphone you selected without you knowing until that point. So I think that is a really cool tool and it's a nice supplemental option for people who are researching microphones. Really cool stuff. I haven't dove too deep into this because I tried it when it was in beta, I think. I wasn't able to get it to work, but I have heard amazing things about it since then. Hopefully that helps. I will link both of the journal entries. Unfortunately, you would have to pay for them to read them. But if you're an AES member, you have access to it. And the audio test kitchen, that's free. Ton, thank you very much for the question. Sorry, I couldn't be more help. I think that would be very, very fascinating to see somebody in an academic setting doing that type of research or somebody at one of these microphone companies doing that type of research. If I'm not mistaken, Harmon does that kind of research, but it's more towards headphone playback and sound reproduction as opposed to microphone recording. And that's where they come up with, I, there's a YouTuber, Metal571, he knows a lot more about this, the Harmon curve, which is an EQ curve that their headphones shoot for, which is based, I believe, 
on a bunch of research and feedback from what people actually like to listen to. So that is why the headphones, the AKG K371s are really popular right now because they go for that Harman target curve and they sound really nice. I don't like them when tracking though. And I prefer my HD 650s over them, but I hope that gives you some insight there. Great question. Secondly, but certainly not leastly, is that how it goes? We have a submission from Eleron. Sorry, I mispronounced that. I apologize. Hi, Bendru. It's Eliran. I'm a voiceover artist all the way from Germany. And I've got a question for you. It's actually three questions. First one, I'm currently working with the smallest interface possible, an ID4, which is amazing. Can you connect a dynamic microphone to the DI in your interface? That would be the question. I've been trying to improvise a talkback option. Now, if I connect my dynamic microphone to the DI entrance to open up another channel, please tell me all the stuff that I'm doing wrong. Again, it's only for a talkback. Second question, can you make a video on that? There are a lot of videos out there regarding how to improvise a talkback mic. How about if you make one of those videos about what are your favorite ways to improvise a talkback mic, similar to the one that you made of how to connect microphones to your computer directly? I just think that your take on it will be valuable. And third and final question, what is your favorite technique or your best technique that you recommend to check your own noise floor? How does one check his recording's noise floor? Thank you, Bendru, and I appreciate you. Eleron, putting me to the fire. Grab my feet, put them on the fire, ask me the tough questions. I did a little thing for you. I did two little things for you. I recorded two quick videos addressing both of these questions. First off, can you connect a microphone to the instrument input of an interface? And secondly, how would I measure the noise floor of my recording? So here is the first one. Can you connect a microphone like the SM58 to the instrument input of your audio interface to use as a talkback microphone? Go back to past Bandrew. All right, so for this example, I have the Shure SM58. I have it connected to an XLR to quarter inch cable, and that is going directly into the Behringer UM2, which is a $30 interface. I am going into input two, which is the instrument input, and I have the level for that input set to 100%, and I am hitting around probably negative 30 decibels because there is such a drastic impedance mismatch here. And that's because the instrument input is expecting an extremely high impedance input source, and a microphone is not that. They are sitting around maybe 600 ohms as opposed to multiple thousands of ohms. So you will need a third-party device. The device I am using is called the Audix T50K, and they describe this as adapting low-impedance microphones to high-impedance quarter-inch inputs. So next, I will plug in an XLR to XLR cable to the SM58, and at the end of that cable, I have the Audix T50K, which converts from XLR to quarter inch. I'll plug that in and show you the levels we're getting there. And now I have connected the XLR to XLR cable into the Audix T50K, and that is plugged into the instrument input for the Behringer UM2. My gain is still set at 100%, but we are now hitting around negative 18 dB, which in my opinion would most likely be fine for a talkback microphone. Probably not going to be the cleanest signal compared to the XLR port, the microphone preamp, but given the fact that you are essentially turning a one-channel microphone preamp into a two-channel microphone interface, I think it's perfectly workable, especially if it's not being used for professional instances where you're actually using the instrument input to record audio that would be released. If it's just for a talkback microphone, I think something like this is perfectly fine. Wow, Pass Bandrew, that was really cool. Thanks for doing that. Oh, you're welcome, Bandrew, in the future. I, I appreciate you. Okay, next question you had was, what was it? How do you measure the noise floor of your recording? I will say this in this quick video. I am almost certain 
that I am doing this wrong and I will get hate mail saying, you're an idiot, man. You're so stupid. I hate how you're so stupid all the time. I'm sure I am going to get emails like that and comments like that. This is how I would do it. I hope this helps you. Eleron, thank you very much for the question. So to measure my noise floor, it may not be the most accurate or dead on measurement, but what I have done is recorded a bit of my microphone chain where I am not talking and not making any noise, and I am going to use a stock plugin in Logic Pro to measure what the noise floor is. The plugin I'll be using is titled Multimeter in Logic Pro, and I will be using the analyzer section of that plugin. I have updated the top or the peak of the meter to be plus 5 dB and the entire range of the meter to be 80 decibels. So that will go from negative 75 dB all the way up to positive 5 dB. The information that I'm most interested in is the peak and the RMS of this signal. The peak is the momentary loudest part of the signal and that is measured at negative 57.7 dB, and RMS is root mean square, I believe that's what it stands for, and that averages the entire sound source that you're measuring. And because I'm interested in the noise floor of this recording, I would most likely be looking at the RMS of this measurement, and I am not even getting picked up on the scale, so my noise floor, I would venture to guess, is below negative 75 dB, which in my opinion is stellar. So that's how I would do it. I am sure I will get some angry comments saying I am doing it completely wrong, but that's how I would measure it. And I hope that gives you a general baseline of how you could approach measuring your noise floor. And there you go. Eleron, again, thank you for the questions. I appreciate so much. Thank you for saying that. I love hearing you guys say I appreciate or I appreciate you. You get you are all too kind. All right. And I think that's actually going to wrap up for today. No news, no freaking out, no hair on fire. We're all going to be fine. You are going to be fine. You're a wonderful human being. I have two announcements for you. First off, tomorrow, Monday the 16th at 9 o'clock p.m. EDT, I will be on the Sunshine Summit with Heather Welch. That's right. You can go to sunshinesummit.live and check out all of her live streams. She's hanging out with people this entire week. What an amazing way to spend some time off. If you need to calm down, you need to take a breather, sunshinesummit.live. Hang out. Go hang out with her. Hang out with us tomorrow. It's going to be a blast. She's doing such a good job over there. And then also, I was just on the Creator Club podcast with... Why did I just stumble over my words? I was on the Creator Club podcast with Josh. I linked it at bandrewscott.com in a recent blog post. I don't think he has a, a vanity URL, so I don't know exactly where to send people. So just look at the most recent blog post on bandrewscott.com. It has the player for that episode in there. And Josh, thank you very much for having me. Heather, can't wait to hang out with you tomorrow. I can't wait to talk to all of you next week. Remember, stay calm. Don't forget your towel. And 42. All right. I love you. I'll talk to you next week. Apriya. Goodbye. This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.